it seems to be the case that Noburu never looked up to uh, Ryuji as a person. He looked up yeah. as an idea. And because the idea came back to him, and the person as well came back to him alongside that, uh, the fact that he was repulsed means that he did not like the person. He liked the idea, right? He wanted the idea to, you know, uh, go off into the sunset, stay away, never come back. And I'm pretty sure what Noburu was hoping for was, like, you know, imagine the idea of Noburu, I mean, I'm sorry, of Ryuji exist in his mind, right? That's what he was hoping for, right? He, he, he it was, it was mm-hmm. a severe case of never meet your heroes uh, kind of phenomenon, right? And so the fact that, you know, he didn't like the fact that no, uh, Ryuji came back means that he did not like uh, Ryuji as a person. Ryuji could have been any other satyr, right? And Noburu still would have uh, liked him. Because it's not the actual satyr that he's like. It's the fact that he, you know, is a personification of a phenomenon that he thinks is dead. Right? He doesn't really care about the actual uh, adult behind the phenomenon. And I think we can all kind of relate to that. And especially, you know, it talks about this a little in the book. But, you know, when you're a kid, right, and you're first growing up, your parents are like gods to you. But then as you become an adult, you realize that they're just people. So everyone kind of has that same thing where you have these like preconceptions and you are in, you know, obsessed with or not obsessed, but you you look at the idea of someone and what they represent. But you don't like look at the person until you mature and then you understand that, you know, they're just a normal person and they're going to let you down. And so I think it's it's something everyone can relate to in that aspect. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean. It's just, you know, that's a great analogy. It's just that, like, I don't feel upset when my parents come home uh, from work, right? That's 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 the very, uh, uh, mm, that's like the, uh, how do you say, like the nail that sticks out. Oh, uh, never mind. Like, that, that's like the detail that's, uh, you know, very distinguishing your, uh, Ryuji's, no, I'm sorry, Noburu's phenomenon from your uh, parents' example, right? There's just so something so weird about him repulsing at the fact that he's coming back, right? Because it tells a lot about his um, uh, conceptions or his thoughts about, you know, society where he lives, right? He's like, bro, we live in a society mm-hmm. where, you know, this place is dead, <laughs> right? We're, this is where dreams go to die. If you come back here, uh, like, um, like this is very, it's like, it's, it's, it's the end of all dreams, right? Like I said, people are going to go to like dead end jobs. Okay. So like, I think, I think what, uh, like nobody really, what he really wanted to do was to escape this, um, uh, this town, right. And, you know, escaping this dead end town, which, you know, uh, you know, actually it can really, um, um, uh, simple. Uh, he can read. He, he, you and I can probably connect to you know, like the manga Akunohana, right? Uh, where you know the protagonist wanted to move away from his uh, dead end uh, um, village uh, countryside, and then he goes into the urban life, and then he he realizes the prop his personal problems are still with him, right? Now you know this isn't about um, uh, Akunohana, so I, I won't get into that much detail, right? I already gave a lot of details on the steel. So, um, I think my point is that, like, no no one sees the uh, uh, town as dead, though, you know? Uh, not a lot of uh, people, people, uh, may, 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 they, they might see the, uh, the town or the city as the same way as Noburu did, but they don't lament about it, right? They know how to uh, adapt to it. Mm-hmm. They know how to make a living by it, right? So, I do really think that it's, it's, it's about... A subject relationship to his surroundings that's causing Noburu the problem, right? It's about how he sees the world that's causing the problem, not really how the world is. So, all in all, likely, right? If if he follows Ruji's uh, footsteps and you know goes off, he um Noburu will never be able to settle down in one place, right? He was he's gonna have to like like the satyr, like kind of like go down from like go from like you know uh, island to island. Uh, Exotic place to exotic place. He can never settle down because as soon as he does, you know, his own uh, poisonous way of thinking, 
right? I'm, I'm gonna call it poisonous because it's it, it kind of like deadens everything that he sees around him. Like he he's gonna have to like jump from place to place. He he has to have a constant state of novelty and explorations, right? And I think uh, that's kind of like the dangerous side of use. You know, it's 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 a fire that burns really quickly. It burns bright, but it's gonna exhaust itself very soon. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, I think Nobru is just the biggest issue and what they maybe alluded to, regardless of whether Yuki or Mishima tried to allude to this, that's what I got from it, was that just in general, Nobru is very immature, right? So given a few years, he might have a very different outlook from the one he has now. You know, he has like, he he looks at this world through a, a very distorted lens where he only sees or only he only wants people to live up to these ideals and you know he'll be disappointed if they don't and if and that's why he's so let down by ryuji coming back now i think that um partly this is due to like that chief character kind of manipulating noboru into like you know trying to get rid of his emotions and stuff so he's falling prey to that and it can come from a load of different things. I mean, it also is very immature in the sense that anyone who's, or, you know, most people who have actually, like, experienced things and, you know, they don't wear rose-colored lenses. Like, people who go to war aren't like, oh, I love the aesthetics of war. This is so aesthetic. It's just, it's the type of thing that outsiders can kind of look upon and then comment on because they haven't truly experienced it. And so Nobaru hasn't experienced any of this sailor stuff. So he just, he looks upon it with these rose tinted glasses, just like, oh, this is amazing. This must be the best life. This is the ideal without experiencing any of the hardships that it actually contains. Oh yeah, you know, never mind the seasickness, the uh, actual sickness that was probably, um, you know, not uncommon at the time, although, you know, British your medicine was improved, but you know, seasickness, um, <clears throat> probably poor nutrition over there so you know um yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's it's probably tough right and uh and you know also yeah sorry um no, just to add on real quick to append to what i was saying nobaru i think is a somewhat a product of the culture he hates right because he's so so vehemently is against the adult life and and giving up your dreams and stuff but at the same time he wants to be a sailor and he's not even pursuing that dream really like he's not going out and achieving he's just sitting on the sidelines and kind of complaining at least that's how i see mm -hmm. at, at the age of 13 can you want to be a sailor what did you say uh, at the age of 13 can you expect him to be a sailor like actually enlist in a in a in a ship dude there are so many like it, throughout history there have been so many deck hands who are just young children and just like go on a boat and just you know tra travel around the world as a deckhand and as slowly as they get older take on more responsibilities that was a very common thing so if in he really wanted to he could in in 1960s because he, he would need the 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 guardian's permission like it's, it's it's not moby dick's time where you could do that it's uh mm -hmm. like the yeah the, but so I, the way i look at it there are a lot of ways to like if you really want something, and you know, very well, maybe if Nobu had become a or he would become a sailor, but it just doesn't seem like outside the sailor thing that he's he's it's he's still just sitting on the sidelines and judging, you know, regardless of whether or not he's he's trying to become a sailor, there is some stuff you know he could do in the meantime and just you know pursue life as opposed to just judging how other people live theirs, um, regardless of whether or not it's sailing. But for the sailing thing, I think. That if you really want something, you can bypass all bureaucratic channels. You know, like he could figure out a way to do it. Even yeah. in, in today's time, it gets harder and harder. Yeah. But you can bypass some of these. Not to mention in Nobru's case, yeah. so the uh, bureaucratic channels are in somewhat to his advantage because the uh, Ryuji is in a uh, fair, like he's, he's, he's not a high, he's not a high position in the entire you know shipping world but it, on his boat he's in a like he's like what like second in command or whatever so he can probably like you know ask to like you know uh tag along like it, it wouldn't make. be that hard in uh no, no bruise case you know 
Yeah. Yeah. Second in command. He's, he's the second mate, like the second crew of the ship. Oh, so he's low. Never mind. But still, it's still. I mean, um, you know, before before uh nine eleven, you could still ask to like, you know, uh, see the insides of a cockpit mid flight. It's, you know, it's, like I don't think uh, Kai is a uh, way too uh uh um. Uh, un- I don't think he's. I don't think his uh, assessment is unrealistic. Um, I will say though, like even if it was unrealistic, you know, he like there could still be like things that he could be doing, like studying about the seas or whatever, like w- something, you know. And to be some- fair, he does know a lot about boats, so he clearly yeah, is yeah. studying mm-hmm. in that respect. But he doesn't need to t- judge while he studies. He doesn't need to judge people for not living up to something that he isn't even living up to yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, speaking of judging, right, I do think, like, a lot of, a lot of the book, if, if you could sum up a lot of the, uh, book, uh, in, in a few words, is that it's about, you know, some kind of atonement and repentance for sins that he thinks he is committing, right, or sing, or, you know, so, like, uh, I think, in in an egotistical fashion, of course, right? I think the killing of the satyr was an atonement for, you know, his own, uh, uh, the fact that, you know, he lost his honor, so to speak, right? It's, he, he told everyone that uh, the satyr was his big shot. Turns out he wasn't, so he's going to kill him, right? And I think uh, this is very related to judging because um, a lot of the times, like, you can say, oh, yeah, you know, he, he can do all this without judging. I, I think part of the why he's doing all this is because he's judging, though, right? I think he, it's, it's, if you look at the book, right, he's very embarrassed about, you know, his life circumstances, you know, and, and you know, justified or not, he's embarrassed, right? He's embarrassed, he's ashamed of where life is going. So I think that's partly why it's fueling him, you know, uh, study about boats, uh, you know, go see random satyrs uh, at the deck and ask them questions, give them a tour, etc., etc. And if that doesn't turn out, then he, like I said, he repents by, or atones by, you know, killing the exact same satyr. So, like, there, there, there is a, uh, um, there is a, uh, one is feuding the other kind of relationship here. Yeah, it definitely comes from a place of, of insecurity where I think, I mean, most judgment comes from where you, you harp on others for your own faults, right? And so he's not living up to this for whatever reason, whatever excuse he gives himself, maybe age is a fair excuse and he feels he needs to be older, but he's, he still shouldn't have to apply that judgment to others because he isn't living his ideal. It's just kind of, I mean, even if that motivates him, it is childish, which I think in general, Nobru is very much a child in every respect. Yeah, and and you you know, <clears throat> it's the whole uh, atonement part, right? And like childish or not, right? That's what he's kind of doing. Right? He's kind of trying to like have some power over the circumstances of his life, right? And it's very tragic, almost that like you know he can't have or he is. Maybe he can, but he is unable to have power over, you know, the circumstances of his life. It turns out that whether he he had the potential or not, he couldn't realize it, right? He couldn't become a saint. He couldn't, you know, have his hopes of the Ruji come alive, right? His his own, his his conceptions of society, uh, how immature it may or may not be, it it was true, right? Uh, how do I say? His convictions were uh, uh, fulfilled. His convictions were fulfilled, uh, regardless of whether those convictions were uh, accurate and representative of actual life or objective reality. Right. So, um, say, Nobru did have some points. Like he is, he is right that a lot of people do kind of give up and fall and fall at the wayside. So he's not entirely wrong. He's just very harsh in mm-hmm. his assessment. Mm-hmm. And so the phenomenon basically is that he all this time he feels very powerless, right? And it is very uh, not I don't want to say tragic, but it is quite the uh, 
quite the phenomenon that the one place that he finds power is through the killings of others, right? Through deaths, right? Um, of course, uh, you know, Yukio Mishima stated in an interview that, you know, uh, as opposed to the West, uh, suicide can be seen as an empowering um, uh, phenomenon, right? Now, not that anyone commits suicide in the book, but, you know, we do kind of see how, you know, death is the one place where um, Nobru has some kind of leverage over how life operates, funnily enough. And I, I do think that's that's a very uh, interesting phenomenon, right? It's it's you cannot have you cannot amount to anything in life, but when you take away life, that's when you have some impact, right? That's when you have some. That's when you can actually like do something for Nobru. That's when Nobru. Sorry, that's when Nobru can do something. I think that's super interesting, right? And it's a uh, precursor to all the uh, themes of death and you know. A dramatic death, right? It's 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 a dramatic death, right? You have you see no decay in uh, Mishima's book, right? Uh, or at least it's not talked about positively, right? It's just instant death, right? It's, it's, you're young and then you die, and I think that repetitive phenomenon is very interesting, uh, especially because uh, all these people are very uh, pessimistic about life, you know. In in patriotism, um, it talks about you know what peace uh, the negative effects peace does to a uh, uh, in, uh, soldier's mind, right? And this is a and this isn't an outsider like you know asceticizing um, uh, the war, right? This is this is a, uh, a phenomenon that's like documented by actual psychologist or you know whatever analysis, um, you know I don't mean psychoanalysis, but like whoever like whatever analysis uh, by done by veterans, right? So not Ernst Jünger, but another Jünger, Sebastian Jünger, literally talks about he was in I think the Middle East, whatever, uh, on behalf of America or some 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 country, some Western country, and he talks about how soldiers miss war, right? Which is something that like patriotism all about. The po the point is, uh, it's very interesting that Yukio Mishima does talk about life in a pessimistic way, and the only um, you know, the only silver lining is that you can kind of like input deaths in that. Uh, phenomenon, right? Death is the one leverage that you have, and I think that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, that that is, it's almost like to Mishima, suicide is controlling just, you know, every step of your fate, right? Because, you know, death is something that is typically uncontrollable. Like, it's it's the inevitable, but you don't have in most cases, any control over it, it'll happen to you at surprising times unexpectedly. But by committing suicide, you are ch taking an iron grip over the the last uh, memory of your life, right? Like you're you're showing that you owned it, you walked your own path, you made every choice for yourself. Yeah, yeah, and um, I don't know. It's interesting, also right? In Nobru's case. Uh... Go ahead. Yeah, in Nobru's case, he has literally no control over his life. Uh, the book starts with his mother locking him up, and it and 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 his mother doesn't trust him. She kind of dictates his whole life, and he has no father figure to uh, actually show him the proper ways. So in that way, yeah, death would be him winning over, uh, winning control over everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense. He's definitely he he feels that he's lost control, and well, and you know when you are thirteen, you don't have a whole lot of control in the first place. You know you have, uh, but there are a lot of kids that have more than Nobru. He's like even you know being locked up, curfew, all that stuff, and so he he feels that he needs to kind of strike out and have an extreme expression of freedom to offset the lack of freedom that he has. Mm -hmm. uh, he meets uh, Luigi in the soaked uh, t uh, soaked shirt. Uh, he had to lie to his mother about going to the beach when he didn't want to go to the beach or something like that. So he, like, even for like little things, he had to go out of his way and make up these stories just to get away uh, from his mother. Mm -hmm. And the whole uh, 
uh, repulsion of femininity in 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 his viewpoint, uh, I think, comes from that part of uh, of his relationship with his mother. How do you think uh, repulsion to femininity is connected to? How do I say? Being uh, hyper controlled well, and his, not having control. His mother. Because if you so this one scene that I talked to you about before we started recording, uh, where he was uh, found out peeping, uh, that shows a lot of uh, uh, a lot of his uh, perspective towards uh, father and mother figures. So there's a line uh, I think in the book that like when she uh, takes him out of the 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 closet, uh, basically a metaphorical womb, uh, she just uh puts him into existence without his own uh own consent and then the father figure who was supposed to uh be some sense into him he also disappoints him by taking a a sort of a, a reserved approach uh to his uh, uh to parenting so at that point he he was betrayed by both his mother and his father because no one actually uh so his mother uh she sort of uh, she gave him life, which he cannot control, and it's being controlled by his mother throughout his life. And then his father, his new father, who couldn't uh, even slap some sense, uh, some sense into him or guide him, he just uh, said, "Yeah, it's it's uh, people make mistakes, and that's what you do." So in 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 that way, there is uh, like you could see that why he doesn't like femininity because he resents his mother for bringing him into life mm. and mm. also giving him any control over, over over the entirety of life how do you guys feel about that scene where he was discovered and ryuji's actions uh following mm. i think that was it oh, it, it oh, could be oh, seen as own, own voyage oh, oh sorry yeah so that that act of uh, prying on his mother could have uh, could could be seen as his own adventure and uh, there are some uh, allegories that could be made between that closet and the sea where like you're in, in uh, or being a, or, or or being in a ship in in uh, amidst the sea so uh, in that way he was uh, yeah that was his own adventure coming to an end and instead of like i think he wanted to be beaten by ruiji yeah or, me too. yeah and because it was may maybe also emasculating for him that he didn't look at him as a man because he was also in his own adventures and he and ruiji didn't look him uh, uh look at him as a man instead uh, he looked at him as a as a as a kid who couldn't be uh hit so yeah, in that way, it uh, sort of uh, yeah took away that entity. I think we talked a little about it last time as well. Yeah, we alluded to it, but we didn't go into full detail because uh, some people there hadn't read the, the second part. But yeah, I I definitely was surprised at Ryuji's lack of action uh, towards that. That was one of the scenes where I'm like, really? You're, you're not going to do anything? What the fuck? And I thought that that was... I mean, obviously... To me, that was meant to exemplify the fact that he has kind of truly fallen from the sea and he he's lost kind of the, the power he may have had. But also, I, I hadn't considered the demasculating part for Nobru. The fact that he wouldn't even be, con it wouldn't even, it didn't even cross Ruji's mind, or it did cross his mind, but he didn't even follow through with like beating Nobru because he didn't see Nobru as, as a real threat in any way. That That's interesting. You also have to consider the, uh... Oh, the mother. No, go ahead. Okay. You also have to consider the... I didn't have a point, I was just... You... <laughs> As I was saying, you also have to consider the uh, factor of being domesticated, right? Uh, oftentimes, that's associated with, like, being feminine, but, like, not in a... Uh, good way, right? They, they, you know, uh, they they do see domestication as like a, a demasculating uh, phenomenon. Uh, 
and you know it's it, we're uh, counter that with like adventure, uh, danger, right? The thing, uh, things like that that uh, satyrs are uh, connotated with, right? That's like the masculine counterpart, right? And I think you know Ryu, uh, Noburu all his life he's kind of like uh, living under this feminine overlord. He wanted some kind of like escape, right? He wanted some kind of adventure away from the grips of like femininity into like masculinity, right? Uh, that's why he doesn't really, uh, when he describes like the uh, female male reproductive uh, organs, he doesn't really talk highly of the female ones. He talks highly of the male ones, so, right? And, well, uh, when when uh, Ryuji handled uh, Nobru the way he did, right? It, it, it reeked of domestication, right? And I think that was a, that was the biggest betrayal on his part. Where what that basically said was that even the seas, right? Even the oceans, right? Even beyond this dead den town, it's sterile. It's um, it's you know, it's stale. It's sterile. It's it's a dead end over there too, right? Even the seas are dead, and I think that was the biggest betrayal. Where he that's when he realized that no matter where he went. You know, it's always going to be like how it was here, right? It's always going to, there. it's always going to have that like, uh, menacing feminine grip all over where, wherever he went. And I think that was the worst punishment that, that was why it was a lot more punished. It was a more of a punishment than actual, uh, domestic abuse. Because remember, Nobru does not like Ryuji as a person. Nobru likes Ryuji as an idea. And when the idea becomes domesticated in the dead and like under the dead in town then that's basically the end of all his ideals all Nobru's ideals are dead down the drain mm -hmm. so yeah it's tragic yeah, yeah yeah no I like that and also you know the big question we don't have to do this yet if you guys have a few more things you want to discuss but just to get you thinking about it is do you think that they killed Ryuji no, oh. I mean, well, I mean, it, 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 there was no that there was this. Uh, I think the last uh, sentence of the book uh, it sort of showed that he had. So he was dreaming about glory and and the way Mishima sort of glorifies death. Uh, so you achieve glory and then you achieve death. Like these are like two mm -hmm. uh, very uh, simultaneous. Uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, according to Mishima, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so in 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 that way, I I, I perfectly see that he's been uh, killed by by the. Uh, yeah, I definitely but, think. Sorry, continue. You no, know, uh, I I just wanted to say that the open ending uh, makes it even better. Like uh, I think the ending was my favorite part of the book. Oh yeah, I thought it was it was nice that he didn't give a concrete answer, but he definitely strongly alluded to. I believe the last line in the book was like "bitter is a or, or glory is a bitter thing," something like that. So he was very much alluded to that they went through with the hard thing. But I'm just left wondering, and I do think um, for the most part, I think that they probably killed him. But a part of me is left wondering for all their talk and you know um, trying killing like small animals, which is very different from a human being. I just wonder if the boys were really uh, walked the talk and were able to actually follow through, or if they just like once he fainted or whatever, they're like, "Oh shit, we we can't do this." Um, and so that's that kind of left in my mind thinking about whether they were strong enough of will because they they kind of paraded around pretending to be strong by acting and uh, going after things weaker than them, but this is the first time they're going after something stronger than them as someone who represented an ideal and physically stronger at that too their mind he's now weaker and he's uh, weaker than them as a collective as well uh, according to them now since he's fallen from grace yeah well this is i mean yeah yeah so the the killing for them would is what would bring bring his strength back but yeah in their eyes right now he is weak but you know it's it's they can philosophically discuss it, but when it comes down to actually, you know, making that uh, killing blow, it's it can't be an easy thing for for children or uh, anyone. Uh, 
go ahead how how do they drink tea in japan is it uh, with sugar or something like usually uh, i hate tea i don't know how how they drink it in japan i'm sorry why do you ask oh are you asking if it's bitter is it- yeah because i mean if you do drink it without sugar it's going to be bitter but if you drink it with sugar the bitterness could be from the grounded up medicines that uh, number three or number four was uh, that's how from. i took it that it was from the medicine that's how i took yeah, it yeah same yeah no i think it's from the medicine as well right and yeah right i i th- that could be and you know i i i just thought it was such a given that Oh, I did, it didn't even occur to me that, you know, he was alive, right? I'm, of course, he was dead. But then now that you mention it, so I'm like, hey, maybe, you know, Yuki was trying to say they couldn't, you know, how do you say, walk the talk or whatever, right? They they, they couldn't yeah. uh, deliver when, you know, the rubber hit the road. So, yeah, it's, it's that's interesting, right? There's also the possibility that Yukio purposely does not want to talk about deaths on paper, Right, it's it's like it's too sacred for him. Right, that's another possibility. Right, you can't you can't uh, paint it with words and uh, you know uh, rational thinking. Right, something that's felt. Right, something that's experienced and immerse you immerse yourself in. That that's another uh, theory that could be given as to why uh, the open that's ended was there. Yeah, no, that's I, I hadn't thought about that. He is very, um, I, you know, I'm trying to think back and I've only read one other Mishma book and I don't think he like he talked about the idea of death, but I don't think there were any actual deaths on paper. Like it was just kind of it was very much strongly alluded to, but no one actually died. Hmm. I wonder if he's killed uh, characters in his other books. I'm definitely going to pick up a few and, and keep that in mind. Yeah, right. Um, because, again. Right. Uh, this is just me, you know, doing some like amateur pseudo uh, psychology on uh, uh, Mishima. But looking at the way he talks of death, right? He never talks about it as a tangible thing. He talks about it as an abstract, as a concept, right? He says, here's what mm-hmm. death does to you. Here's why people die. It, it's very aloof and it's very conceptualized. And I do think that... Um, you know, if you kind of put it into the realm of something that's tangible, where you can comprehend it, uh, it does kind of, uh, iron- uh, not ironically, but strangely enough, it kind of kills the uh, living uh, magic of death itself almost, right? You kind of have to, like, put it in an unreachable, uh, unreachable uh, sphere of thinking, if, 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 that's, if, uh, if I could say it like that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Never wrote deaths in paper. Yeah, I mean, you know, um Do you think Ryuji would have wanted to die at that moment, like with those thoughts of glory? Oh in of his course head? not. No, because no, he, he, of, he of course he showed... no. No, no, no. Uh of course not. I, I do think that because he, he does seem very uh adamant about, you know, settling down with uh um um the, uh, the widow, whatever her name, Fusuka. Yeah, the, Fusuka. Fusuka. I'll tell you this though: if um, a god or some deity, some divine figure, whoever, right, came to him and said, you know, um, yeah, dude, these kids points in you. Uh, mm-hmm. Should he have come to accept it right then and there? I do think it would it would have been a very peaceful and. I don't want to say glorious, but it would have been a very peaceful death, right? It would have been something that's very uh, full of ecstasy, because I I think for the, there he he would uh, kind of like go back to the uh, uh, line between life and death that he had uh, many times been on in his sailing uh, adventures. But no, I don't think he wanted to because die. I don't think like yeah. Here's the way I look at it. In that moment, he reminisced a lot on, on glory, and he was like, it, you know, it was almost like uh, the way it was written, a part of him wanted to go back to the sea, and he was thinking about how kind of, uh, how much, how important it was to him. And he was finally confronting that after settling down for, like, what, a, a week? He was finally, like, thinking, and like, wow, this really was a big thing to me. Why did I leave it? And so I don't think he explicitly you know, would have killed himself or would have chased after death. But I feel like 
as you said, if someone told him that he was going to die in that moment, I think he may have accepted it and been like, okay, this is my last, this is my glorious moment, you know? Um, and I think for him, he couldn't have done it himself, but maybe the kids doing it to him is, is what left his mark on the world in a way. But also then, you know, the rational side of me is like, okay, well, it, it's not too much of a mark uh, on the world. These will probably be buried. And, you know, he, he wasn't a, uh, he, he doesn't get anything from it, really. It's just kind of a, a fruitless death. And so it's, there are two sides kind of fighting, thinking about the romanticism of it and then the reality of it. Yeah, yep. And nowhere do we see Ryuji talk about deaths as Noburu talks about it. That's the thing, right? He, Noburu talks a lot about, may talk about, he doesn't even talk. See, here's the thing. Noburu never talks about adventure. Noburu never talks about danger. Noburu never talks about, you know, uh, sailing and exploring. These are all uh, things that uh, uh, he, he does. He does, right? But in the past, right? He, he does, but he talks about it as if it were his dreams, right? As if it were something he longed for. Same thing with uh, uh, Ryuji, right? So, like, both Ryuji and Noburu talk about it, but we see no evidence of Noburu actually seeing, uh, experiencing it on a perpetual basis, right? If ever, right? If I recall correctly, right, it's what Noburu wants to go at, right? It's the reaching for the uh, unattainable dreams that it's, that's what's driving him. It's not, the, it's not the destination himself, right? And you could compare that to, you could compare that aloofness of the destination to death, right? Even... Both of them are not very written in the book. They're kind of what people are driving towards, right? Or being driven towards, sorry, because, you know, no one's killing themselves. They're being killed. So, in that sense, you know, uh, like, uh, how do I say, man? Like, there's a, there's a non-materialistic thinking about deaths that Noburu has, right? Uh, Ryuji probably thinks about uh, death, maybe in a materialistic way. Definitely Fusako, right? For who does? How does Fusako talk about death? Fusako talked about it about how you know what it does to the family, right? It, you know, the dad was a good man. He died. He can no longer take care of us, right? He talked. Fusako talks about tangible effects dying has. He doesn't. She never talks about you know it as an abstraction, right? He talks about how would it affect the immediate life? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that's another reason why death isn't really talked a lot about explicitly. Because you can't you can't make it tangible. You can't make it material. The whole uh, non-material uh, aspect of whatever phenomenons was kind of what gave it their magic. Whether it be death, like I've just been saying, or whether it's uh, exploring the seas and adventure. Right, you can't really, you know, uh, put it down into words, put it down into, you know, concrete uh, analysis, because that's what kind of kills it. You have to kind of like put it uh, aloof and something that you can attain for, but you don't really know what it is. So that's that's interesting, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, sorry, I'm, so I'm just I'm thinking about it. I'm like processing, trying to to think about it. And you know, the the point that Noboru never talks about um, adventure stuff is very interesting. He's just obsessed with the ending. The journey almost doesn't matter to him. I'm trying to like process that. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm <laughs> um. You know, and so so Pataco has a really right rational view on death and which is supposedly a masculine trait is it i i, I don't know and, I, I don't know i just said it was materialistic i never said it was no yeah in, in that because uh, i don't know like last week when we were talking about the uh dionysian apollo apollo Nian thing uh the rationality and emotions are like different uh no. uh uh, things that are attributed to the so rationality is supposed to be masculine and 
emotional, like emotions are supposed to be feminine. But in that way, you're now you're seeing that the roles are sort of reversed. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's the 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 change of society that uh, Fosako represents, that, or uh, she. It it could just be that Mishima is just trying to blend that uh, that divide, and I that's that that was my thought because he seems very to me, and I mentioned this last meeting, but he seems to represent both sides, uh, the uh, Apollonian and Dionysian, in very in very extreme respect for both of them. So I think com combining them and blending them together would be kind of his path. He's not trying to entrench that divide; he wants it brought together. Yeah, absolutely. But then again, when I uh, think of it in the in in a more bigger picture, like I I, I just get more confused at what was Mishima's moral stance or uh, throughout the whole. Like he doesn't take one uh, he he doesn't take an explicit stance, which is good. But because uh, we discussed what these different characters represent uh, in the book, uh, the the different parts of Japanese uh, post-war society, and uh, and. I always thought that he was more of a of a conservative guy, and he wanted the 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 society to uphold these uh, traditions of the past. So now it just yeah, I just get more confused on his uh, his actual well, philosophy. I think it's um you know another important thing to recognize is, and it's very easy to draw uh, from characters in a novel to draw you know guesses at the actual beliefs of the writer, but a great writer is able to write characters that are completely different from him in belief but still feel alive and aren't just villainized and i think mishima is a great writer you know and i think he's definitely he leaned a little more toward the conservative side but he was also very much in in artist and i think conservatism and art kind of clash in in many instances um and so i think he was definitely open to uh, a lot of progressive ideas, and yeah, I'm pretty sure he was gay. <laughs> like, if you read Confessions of a Mass, you can see that he was very open to progressive ideas, and he was not trying to like silence, uh, or he wasn't a conservative as we see it today. Maybe, or at least I see it in America. Yeah, you you have to remember that uh, ideas like homophobia wasn't really ah. Uh, I I can't really say that it was. Non I don't know if it was non-existent in the feudal uh, eras of Japan, right? There was a phenomenon of it, of you know, like, of of it, um, of gay people in feudal Japan. So it's not a, like a traditional thing, you know. Um, and you know, uh, da -da -da -da. and even if there was, it was it was definitely not on religious grounds, right? It was most likely on you know, social grounds. I would doubt that they were homophobic because you're gay. I d I'm pretty sure they were homophobic because you were different, right? So, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, you know, uh, Mishima was a contradictory figure, right? But I'm, I'm just bringing that up because it is possible that they're not contradictory in the case of, you know, maybe Japanese culture. I don't know, okay? I'm, I'm only, I'm only Japanese by ethnicity. I'm not very, uh, well, knowledgeable in their, uh, uh, culture, but, yeah, that's just my uh, bet. And you have to remember, kind of back to the book, this isn't, like, I don't see a contradiction to Mishima's conservative philosophies here. Like, like where do you see the, like, where do you see the uh, progressiveness in this book, right? I, I think, if anything, this is a, uh, like, a setup, right? It's, you're setting up for the batter, where it's like, okay, here are, here are the problems of post-war Japan. Uh, you have these, um, all of these dead dreams, people are settling them down, people are materialistic, people are, you know, I, I think, I think Mishima is, although he is presenting the kid as a very immature child, I think he is, you know, siding with the kid here, right? He's, he's like saying, he's like saying, where is this, like, naive, ignorant, youthful, bashful dreams, right? Where is this, you know, gusto that people lack nowadays, right? Well, you know, it, it may be so ridiculously stupid to go after it but like there's some you know purity and honesty in that where is that right right he's saying that i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. he, i wouldn't be surprised if he's saying that it's lacking so i don't see any contradiction between his uh uh le political leanings and the contents of the book and yeah i mean he is right like 
in in general, I think uh, a lot of people maybe lack um, ideals, and you know they're kind of okay. And accepting, there's a lot of movements now that are just like, especially with the whole body positivity thing of just accept yourself or whatever. And it seems like to an extent people are becoming somewhat weaker, but I just think no brew is so judgmental. And, you know, I find myself doing it all the time. Uh, it's hard not to be, but I think you can have a, a kind of, you know, and I think there's a lot of issues with stoicism, but I think you can have kind of a, a stoic outlook when it comes to judging other people and, and having an ability to just kind of represent a a good uh represent like a um what was what i'm looking for motivate other people through representing mm -hmm. a good uh ah what's what's the like a figure that people want to follow yeah uh, is yeah. what i'm trying to say uh -huh. Uh -huh. not to be judgmental and bring them down and so I totally understand where Mishima is coming from. And, you know, I, I agree in a lot of respects, but I think the way he wrote Nobru, and I don't know if he agrees with this or not, is he just made Nobru very judgmental. And yes. I think that's the issue. Mm -hmm. But you do realize that it's very possible that he made him judgmental on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, that's how I see it. That's how okay. I see it. Okay. And, and it's very, it may well be the case that he wasn't supportive of that judgment. He wasn't supportive of how it manifested. Yeah. But he was supportive of was the unrestrained, uh, unrestrained, uh, you know, hot-headed uh, character. That's what he was going for, right? Something that hasn't been tamed by domesticated consumer society. That's what he was going for. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely think, I, as I said before, like, it's, it, you, it, you should be careful as to not, draw conclusions about too many conclusions about the author from the character you know because mm -hmm. he can write flaws into the character that he doesn't agree with but also write ideas into the character that he very much does to follow and believe usually i would agree but uh, in in the cases of writers like mishima or dostoevsky who who write books about ideas and lead troubled lives I see their books as uh, them trying to understand life in in a way that they couldn't in 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 real life. So in that way, like I I, I can see that Noburu was might have been uh, inspired by his own childhood because uh, he also had this controlling grandmother who sort of uh, made him do what like like stupid stuff and like wouldn't uh, 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 make uh, wouldn't let him hang out with the uh, with with uh with male kids so in that way i i, I have to uh say that a writer like mishima would uh, put a lot of his own uh, life in in his characters and in this book he basically shows that um, any sense of morality that you can uh conjure up uh, uh that is based upon these uh, uh ideas of uh of, of glory and and heroism it's obviously not going to be uh right it's he, he sort of reminds me of that uh, dimitri karamazov character like he also had this passionate uh approach to life and, and 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 that passion sort of manifested in 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 his moral choices and uh, in that way i don't know like noboru seems uh not a good representative of uh uh, of uh, of an ideal character that 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 sorry mm -hmm. you cut out yeah sorry I got a uh, yeah I I I got like, yeah someone was else was calling me uh, uh where did I cut out uh you you, you see no Nobu as like it. yeah. Noburu as Dimitri. Oh, yeah, so I Noburu, I, I mean, no, Noburu's uh, moral choices, like uh, the way his ethics manifested themselves, they were almost from a point of passion rather than a point of reason or point of spirituality. Yeah, yeah. And, and if that is what Mishima is saying, that, I mean, as you said, Kohei, that he must, uh, uh, he must, uh, like he was wondering where this uh, pomp, no, not pompous, but like this, uh, uh, this gallant part of 
of, of society has gone to, uh, then he must be also critiquing that the moral choices born out of these uh, gallantry is going to be wrong in, in an objective sense. So, yes. There I mean, lies my my confusion about 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 what 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 his moral stance actually was sure, in sure. regarding this book. Yes, and uh, you know I think it's purposely confusing, which then begs the question. I don't see, like you kind of made the uh, conjecture that uh, it was you know contradictory to Mishima's uh, political stance, but I just don't see the contradiction. It's kind of my point, right? That's what like I was kind of like saying. I was just I was I was basically saying. All this like passionate factors in Nobu's life, and saying that hey, it's not very uh, contradictory to Mishima, right? Because Mishima was a contradictory person, whatever contradictions to you know mainstream conservatism uh, Nobu has, it might be right. It might be contradictory to mainstream conservatism, but the more it contradicts uh, mainstream conservatism, it does not contradict uh, Mishima. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also, you know, why must he put himself in a political box and be one thing and not have a mix of yeah. different ideas? Yeah. On that, maybe some of them are supposed to conflict, but when you actually look at them and analyze them, they only conflict because they're on either side of the aisle mm-hmm. and they aren't actually contradictory elements. You have to remember this isn't Ayn Rand, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I ju- I just read the Fountainhead a few months ago, and like, you know, there were some parts that were, were really good, but wow, she just completely demonized any idea that was different from her. <laughs> like, she just she did not even try to like show any uh, intelligent, you know, respect to um, foreign ideas. Or it was how it was so extreme. You just cut out. Uh, oh, okay. So, like, you know, I mean, I don't want to stay on this fountain uh, on rant topic, but like, I mean, I I did bring it up. So sorry, but like, uh, there was there wasn't a lot of sophistication, right? It it was all her enemies were like yeah. one dimensional. It was like here's here's the definition of all these enemies. It's one dimensional. That's it. There's nothing mm-hmm. else to them, right? Um, I'm gonna yeah. bring it back to uh, Mishima now, right? It's Mishima. Uh, okay, you know, like you do see that in Dostoevsky. Right, a bit. You do see how Ivan's always this like um, uh, rational. Black dude, was also rational. Pro- Pardon? But yeah, Dostoevsky in, in, in like Dostoevsky was also trying to basically say that a, mora- a morality de- de- derived from pure reason is always going to fail you as well. Oh yes, so, yes, yes. Uh, well, it, my, 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 that, yeah. My point is that like Dostoevsky too does have that does have that one dimensional aspect that makes Ayn Rand so infamous. However, there is still some kind of transformation as we see with like Raskolnikov, right? Uh, and you know we do see. I mean, uh, Ryuji's whole life in the book is a transformation, right? From from the satyr to the dead domesticated uh, to be husband. So yeah, like I I, I think Mishima. Uh, was a very um his writing style is very um expressive eh it's very expressive it's very uh twists and turns all that and i don't know um alosha i'll I'll let you finish on uh, uh what you had to say there before uh before i cut you off but um yeah i i just want to like before to to end the note, right? I'll I'll let you go first, Alosha, of course. But uh, to to let you go, um, uh, I just wanted to like yeah, you know okay, give, give some like quick with... yeah quick what did you what? I, I forgot what I was okay fine before. whatever yeah so uh, <laughs> yeah sorry I'm kind of brain dead today um so yeah <laughs> you know. I was just what I was saying. Yeah, you know, his writing style is very expressive. So, like, why don't we finish? You know, we've been here for an hour, so that's probably a good time to, uh, you know, conclude the uh, book club. So, why don't we finish on, like, you know, the thoughts on the book, right? Like, how we felt about the book. It was a very short novel. You know, was it good? Was it bad? Uh, things like that. I, I loved it. 
I, I loved it. I think Mishima's writing very much derives from passion, which, you know, can be, uh, you know, can conflict with reason, but it very much derives from passion. All of his characters are very passionate in their respects. And this book was kind of about uh, losing passion in a way and saying that Ryuji has lost passion according to Nobru, but you know, in my eyes, he just, he changed his passion or whatever, but I really like that passionate writing. And I think it just feels fun to read, you know, like you're reading this stuff. Wow. This is awesome. <laughs> like even, even things that intellectually I disagree with, I'm like, Hey, the glory, man, this is, this is really fun. And I, I think that was one of my favorite parts of the book was just how extreme his writing is. And I really like that. I like the book. Uh, I, I like the style. Uh, I like that there were so many ideas. I didn't necessarily agree with any of them, but uh, uh, that was a fun read. And I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll read another one in, of, of Mishima's book this year just because I like books about ideas. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. We're doing Sun and Steel in July. So, yeah. That's the that's like the essay he did on working out and stuff. Yeah, like, working out, my... post physique. Yeah, pretty much. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. all right. Well, uh, uh let's uh, let's uh, conclude the book, eh? That was uh, the second and final meeting. Of, uh, unless do you guys have anything else to say? Um, not really. We kind of covered a, you know, anything that I may have been confused or you know wanted to hear other opinions on. Oh. Well, I okay. hope uh, I hope this broke up with uh, of satisfactory levels. Um, so yeah, that's the second and final meeting of uh Seder who fell from the Seder who Seder who fell from grace of the sea of Seder who fell from the sea of the praise. It's the first one. Yeah, but yeah, second and final meeting. Thanks for listening, guys. Make sure to like and subscribe for more. See ya. <laughs>